Our scripture text this morning is from the book of Jonah, beginning in uh, verse 1 of chapter 3. This is a story, of course, that we've all heard if we grew up in Sunday school, but we probably look at it more this morning a little bit from an adult perspective. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, Get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. Jonah began to go into the city going a day's walk, and he cried out, Forty days more, and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. When the news reached the king of Nineveh, he rose from his throne, removed his robe, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat in ashes. Then he had a proclamation made in Nineveh. By the decree of the king and his nobles, no human or animal, no herd or flock shall taste anything. They shall not feed, nor shall they drink water. Humans and animals shall be covered with sackcloth, and they shall cry mightily to God. All shall turn from their evil ways and from the violence that is in their hands. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fierce anger so that we do not perish. When God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? That is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious and merciful God, slow to anger, abounding in steadfast love and relenting from punishment. And now, O oh Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, Is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what would become of the city. May God bless this reading of the word. Rhonda and I attended seminary in Berkeley, California in the mid-1970s. And as you know, that's a university town with quite a mix of causes and interests swirling around. And as we would walk across the University of California campus to get to class, people from various cults and causes would often try to get our attention and our interest and sometimes our money. At that time, there was a street preacher that everyone called Holy Hubert. He stationed himself at Sather Gate at the entrance to the University of California campus, and he preached hellfire and brimstone. And occasionally a passerby would try to outsmart Hubert, but Hubert was witty and very sharp with his comeback. I don't think I ever saw anyone get the better of Holy Hubert. Whenever I passed Holy Hubert, I reflected that standing on a street corner, shouting at the passing crowd on behalf of God was not something that I could ever see myself doing. I was quite sure that preaching on the street was not my calling. In the first chapter of the book of Jonah, we read how God called Jonah to go preach in the big city of Nineveh, and to warn them to change their ways. We read, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, son of Amittai, saying, Go at once to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. God was apparently calling Jonah to become the holy Hubert in the capital of the Assyrian Empire, and Jonah wanted none of it. Nineveh was located east of Jonah's home, so Jonah hopped on a boat heading west. Jonah did not want to be a prophet to Nineveh. When we meet Jonah in today's scripture passage, God has rescued him from a storm at sea. We know the story from Sunday school of Jonah and the whale. 
Although the Bible just says a great fish swallowed him up and then spit him out on dry land three days later, the real point of the story doesn't come until chapters three and four, our text this morning, where God continues to deal with this reluctant prophet. I have sometimes heard people say that to find God's will for our lives, we should follow our bliss. Scholar Joseph Campbell famously said, follow your bliss. If you do follow your bliss, you put yourself on a kind of track that has been there all the while waiting for you. And the life you ought to be living is the one you are living. And when you can see that, you begin to meet people who are in the field of your bliss and they open the doors to you. I say, follow your bliss and don't be afraid and doors will open where you didn't know they were going to be. If you follow your bliss, doors will open for you that wouldn't have opened for anyone else. Well, certainly there is something to that advice. If God has created us and endowed us with certain interests and talents, those interests and talents must surely point us in a possible direction that our lives might take. But we also know that Jesus said when we follow him, we must take up our cross daily. There are those extraordinary times in life when something out of the ordinary needs doing on behalf of the world. And sometimes we get a call to do something that needs going beyond our zone of bliss. Over the years in pastoral visitation, I've sometimes sat with a person who wondered why he or she was still here in the land of the living. The person had outlived their health and their money and their friends and was ready for life to end. And somewhere I read of a young pastor who was visiting with an older lady who expressed those uncomfortable thoughts. She told the young pastor, I don't know why I'm still here. So he responded hopefully by saying, well, God must still have something for you to do. And she said, well, I'm not going to do it. <laughs> In that exchange, it was the younger person who was perhaps not emotionally prepared to enter that woman's loneliness and weariness. So he turned away from her Nineveh. By the time most of us reach midlife, we have a pretty good sense of what we're suited for and what we are not. And Jonah was sure that he was not suited to call Nineveh to repentance before the God of Israel. So he ran in the opposite direction. They don't, scholars aren't exactly sure where Tarshish is, but some think it may have been as far west as Spain. But Jonah could not escape God's pursuit. Psalm 139 reminds us that there's no escaping God's presence in our world and in our lives. We read, where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, you are there. If I take the wings of the morning and sell at the, settle at the farthest limits of the sea, even there your hand shall lead me and your right hand shall hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me and the light around me become night, even the darkness is not dark to you. The night is as bright as the day, for darkness is as light to you. That is a wonderful promise. No matter how far we fall, God is there with us. But it's also a challenge no matter how far we run and seek to escape from God's call, we cannot hide. God called Jonah to head eastward on a mission to Nineveh, but Jonah headed west and said, seeking to escape God's call. So at the beginning of chapter three, God tries one more time with Jonah. We read the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time saying, get up, Go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. In the story of Jonah, we learn that God is the Lord of all the earth and of all of the people in it. 
The sailors in the first part of the Jonah story refer to God by the generic word God. And so do the Ninevites in our passage this morning. But Jonah refers to God by the Hebrew covenant name, Yahweh. We can imagine that the people of Nineveh spoke a different language and had a totally different religion from Jonah's, but God still sent his servant on this unwelcome mission of compassion to them. There is a time certainly to follow our bliss, to do the thing that just feels right for us. But while we were doing that, God is following us. And sometimes we must head east instead of west, out of our comfort zone towards a greater need. Verse three of our text tells us that this time Jonah obeyed God. We read, so Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. But he was really kind of half-hearted about it. We we're told that Nineveh was such a huge city that it could take a person three days just to maneuver through it. So Jonah just sort of dips his toe in the water of being God's prophet. He obeys just enough to say that he has done what God asked of him. Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk, and he cried out, 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. Jonah, like Holy Hubert in Berkeley, stood just inside the town boundaries and shouted at passersby. But he apparently had no hope that his mission would be successful. In fact, we learn that Jonah hoped it would fail because he wanted those Ninevites to get what was coming to them. He wanted to do just enough to be able to say, I tried that once and it didn't work. A few years ago, I was listening to a young adult telling me about his struggle with substance abuse. And when I asked about trying a 12-step program, I was told, I've tried that and it doesn't work. We do this in our church life sometimes too, don't we? An idea is brought forward from some corner and someone says, oh, we tried that and it didn't work. But could it be that God is trying once more to send us to Nineveh? Nineveh was located in what is present day Iraq. In fact, the modern city of Mosul is on the site of ancient Nineveh. The prospect of becoming a street preacher in such a city must have been terrifying to Jonah. But to his amazement, the people of Nineveh responded to his message. We read in verse five of chapter three, and the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast and everyone great and small put on sackcloth. We modern people have our own Ninevehs inhabited by modern Ninevites, places and people with whom we do not want to have any dealings people who just don't get it, people who are so different in lifestyle or belief that we have no hope for them. I wonder who lives in your Nineveh? Is it those people of a different political party, a different religion, a lifestyle very different from your own? Someone whose personal pain we cannot and do not understand. Once when our son was in the hospital in Philadelphia, my wife Rhonda was staying with him. She was looking out the window of the hospital room burdened with many heavy concerns when she felt a gentle touch on her shoulder and heard the words, I will pray for your son. She turned to see who it was standing behind her and saw the Muslim mother of the child in the other bed. We ourselves are sometimes lost deep in the heart of our own Nineveh. The God of all compassion may send some unlikely Jonah to speak a word to us. Jonah was disappointed with the people of Nineveh. They were not predictable. They had repented. Listen again to verse 10. When God saw what the Ninevites did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. 
as disappointed as Jonah was with the turn of events. He was, in fact, angry at God for not giving the Ninevites what they deserved. In chapter 4, we read, but this was very disappointing to Jonah, and he became angry, so angry, in fact, that he wanted to die. He prayed to the Lord and said, Oh, Lord, is not this what I said while I was still in my own country? Scripture repeatedly shows us that God is not the unmoved mover of some philosophers. The God we worship is a God in relationship. In response to the Ninevites' repentance, Scripture tells us that God changed the plan. Jonah wanted a God who operates with a zero-tolerance policy toward bad people. Jonah complained, I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. And you notice by the tone of his voice that that wasn't praise. Commenting on this story of Jonah, Rabbi Abraham Heschel once wrote, history would be more intelligible if God's word were the last word final and unambiguous like a dogma or an unconditional decree. It would be easier if God's anger became effective automatically. Once wickedness had reached its full measure, punishment would destroy it. Yet beyond justice and anger lies the mystery of compassion. That way of compassion points us toward the cross God's supreme compassion for a wayward humanity. Jesus challenged his disciples then and now to take up the cross of compassion daily. The words of our hymn express this so powerfully. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave. Weep o'er the erring one, lift up the fallen, tell them of Jesus the mighty to save. Rescue the perishing. Care for the dying. Jesus is merciful. Jesus will save. Though they are slighting him, still he is waiting, waiting the penitent child to receive. Plead with them earnestly. Plead with them gently. He will forgive if they only believe. Let us pray. O Lord, send us to Nineveh this week, wherever and whoever that may be. Grant that we as your church, disciples of Jesus, may rescue the perishing and care for the dying. Help us to plead earnestly and gently, for it's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.